Hi there, it's Louise Byrne, political correspondent with the Irish Mirror. As part of the Irish Mirror's Stop the Violence campaign, speaking about domestic violence, I sat down this week with Justice Minister Helen McEntee. We spoke about domestic violence, we spoke about the number of women being killed, about refuge spaces. It was a really wide ranging conversation. I learned a lot. Um, I hope you find it interesting and that you also learn a lot too. Minister McEntee, thanks so much for sitting down with us as no part problem. of this campaign we're running with the Irish Mayor um, about women's violence and violence against women. Um, we've done some research over the last couple of weeks and Women's Aid indeed had research on this as well. And their new figures there to show that there was 12 or 13 women killed in Ireland last year, which is a doubling on the year before. Taking off your Justice Minister hat, I suppose, as a woman, how do those figures make you feel? Do you know, every time I saw something in the newspaper last year and even coming into this year, you just, you feel, it kind of hits you every single time. Um, and I certainly felt last year and even this year, like it was happening too often. Um, and I think particularly for women, when you read that, you're just thinking why or how. We're, we're talking about domestic violence more, we're, we're doing more, we're committed to doing more, particularly after COVID. And so the fact that there were more women murdered last year, it just it really doesn't sit well because you think it should be turning. We should be, you know, people should be thinking twice about it or, you know, we should be seeing figures go in the opposite direction. So it's uh, it makes me more determined to actually turn those figures around and have less women in that situation. But at the same time, it, like it's, it's, it's upsetting. It's upsetting for every woman, I think, to see that. Yeah, a senior guard has actually told us that when you hear of a murder now, it's actually more likely to be a woman than it is to be a murder related to gangland. Does that take you by surprise that we've kind of moved away from those gangland murders to m women being murdered being more common? I'm not surprised, but yeah, I mean, the Garda figures last year showed that there were more women killed in domestic incidents than there were more general homicides that you could say um, and I just say what you know we should be screaming from the rooftops when that happens um, you know we have a plan in place we're working towards it but everybody should be sitting up and saying why is this happening how can I do more how can I prevent this from happening and given that the plan is in place it's disappointing for you as minister that we see those numbers going up and they seem to be increasing rather than coming down which is what the government's plan intends to do so we only published the plan last year. Um, there's a lot in it. Um, we have a first 18 month implementation plan. So we're coming up on the first year. And you know, there's lots of things that we're working on that we have achieved that will be achieved in the next few months, um, whether it's new legislation. So in the coming weeks, I'll enact new laws around stalking and non-fatal strangulation. We'll increase our maximum sentences for assault causing harm. Um, I hope sending very clear and very strong signals to people who are currently abusers or thinking about it or find themselves in that situation. Um, but also there's been a lot of work done in trying to raise awareness in national campaigns, in encouraging people to come forward. And what's really encouraging in the last year, despite these figures, the number of people coming forward has actually increased. So particularly since COVID where there was a real, real focus on getting into people's homes via their social media, TV channels, whatever way we could to say there's supports here, there's resources here, there's people to help you. And because of that, we've actually seen an increase in people coming forward. So it might look, it, it might look negative that more women are seeking help. To me, that's a positive. It means more women are and coming forward. Do you think that's the full story? Do you think there's women who aren't coming forward? And what can you do to get them to come forward? 100%. I, I think what we have is only the tip of the iceberg, to be honest. Um, when you look at the figures that were published last week, uh, the CSO figures as well, the sexual violence surveys. I mean, one in five women who've been raped uh, or sexually assaulted. So you apply that to any group of people you know, any group of girls that you're part of or that you know, any room you walk into. I mean, we're only getting the tip of the iceberg here. So we need to keep working. We need to make sure the zero tolerance plan, which sets everything from education to how we respond you know, through the criminal justice system, the courts, to support some resources. We just have to keep working at it, putting money behind us and making sure everybody's behind us and on board with this. Do we know why these numbers are increasing? Has there been any studies done by the department to look at why the number <coughs> of women who are being not only killed, but also subjected to domestic violence? Is, is Ireland an outlier on this? Is this a global problem? Do we actually know why this is happening? It's a global problem. Um, and it's something that I talk to my colleagues internationally and, and uh, on a European basis, we held a conference uh, last September here and it was a European conference where I invited over 35 countries to join me in focusing on domestic violence, what we can do more where countries haven't signed up to what's called the Istanbul Convention, which is a convention basically 
uh, bringing people to a point where they are saying as a government and as a country we're going to tackle this, we're going to put laws in place, we're going to put so supports in place and then people are actually monitored or the countries are monitored. So I mean Ireland's not an outlier but what we haven't done well in recent years and what we're starting to do now is gather data. So as part of the zero tolerance strategy there's a commitment to do on a five year basis uh, new strat or new uh, surveys with the CSO. Uh, the most recent one that we published was a sexual violence survey. The next one we're now doing is on domestic violence and then we'll do the subsequent sexual violence survey. So the information then that we get from that, it'll feed into what I'm doing, it'll feed into the resources and supports that are needed, it'll feed into the campaigns because we're getting different snippets of information that we simply don't have and we haven't had to date. From a legislative point of view, I know you have brought in the rules around stalking and around manual strangulation, you've increased the sentences. Is there any more that you intend to do? Like, for example, there's a woman, a Limerick woman, she's called Leona O'Callaghan, and her rapist, um, she went public with her story, and her rapist, because he was already serving a sentence for an, uh, raping another young girl, <coughs> he, basically his sentence is going to run concurrently. So what Leona's point was is that her rapist is basically given what she branded a free rape, and because these sentences, she's only effectively serving one sentence, that justice hasn't been served for one of those women. Have you any intention to look at something like that and changing those laws so that sen those sentences run back to back rather than at the same time? So specifically to that issue, unfortunately it's not something that I can intervene in, so with the separation of powers it is for a judge to decide, so while I would love to in those kind of instances make my own opinion known and to direct in whatever way from a, a, a Minister for Justice point of view, I'm not allowed to, so there, there is a separation of powers. And you do have certain cases where you do have consecutive sentences. What I can do and what I am doing as part of the zero tolerance plan is making sure that there's a greater focus on education within the judiciary when it comes to rape, sexual assault, domestic violence cases. So we have as part of uh, what's called supporting a victim's journey, that's all about how we can support victims through the judicial process. Um, we have a plan around training judges that's already started so we have people who have come forward and volunteered to actually take up training in this space so that they're better, they have better knowledge of how to deal with victims of how to respond to these type of cases but also as part of the strategy and this is it's not in the current plan uh, for this year but next year and beyond looking at potentially having specialized domestic and sexual violence judges so like family courts where we're going to have specialist judges in family courts that we would have specialist judges dealing with these type of cases and for me that's so important because if you have a judge that is <clears throat> understanding of what victims go through how you can re-traumatise victims through the process, uh, but also what is appropriate in terms of the crime and the sentence matching each other. And so often what we see and what people feel is that the sentence simply doesn't match the crime that's happened. Do you think there is a good enough understanding as we currently have it within <coughs> the courts, within the Gardaí, about what these people are going through and what these victims... and Because it's a scary ex experience, I'm sure, for a lot of them going yeah. into court. And in many instances, the alleged perpetrators in the courtroom as well. So do you think there is a good enough understanding with, within the judiciary and within the Gardaí about those moments for people? I think it's improving. But I think there's a lot of work to do. So while we're talking about educating judges, we're also talking to the Law Society and the Bar Council to make sure our solicitors and our barristers are trained and understand how to support people. The Gardaí now have a permanent um, part of their educational process in Templemore that looks at domestic violence and then you obviously have teams that are in specialist um, specialist teams within Ungar the Síochána that deal solely with domestic and sexual violence. Um, but separate to that, I think what's really important and what came back to me in a lot of the engagement I've had with victims over the years is that for victims even understanding what happens to them, to go into a courtroom, where you sit, how you are part of the actual process, because it's the prosecution works on your behalf and you are part of the trial. Um, where can they find support? How do they have legal support? How do they have someone that helps them through the process? So we're putting together ways to navigate that system for victims, be it online, that they can click on a website, the Victims Charter, uh, and see, you know, what am I entitled to? What does this look like for me? Who do I need to talk to? What supports are available? Um, that wasn't there before, but we're getting better at, at putting those resources in place.
obviously since you've become minister you've put in a lot of new legislation about like I said stalking manual strangulation you're looking at increasing the sentences is there anything else from a legislative place that like anything more that you can do or is you kind of exhaust all your options is there anything you'd like to do before a general election so well, no we certainly have, haven't exhausted our avenues um, we introduced Coco's law as well which is really important around um, sharing of intimate images and making it a criminal offence which it wasn't uh, I have legislation which will essentially put in place a new agency for domestic and sexual violence um, and the intention is that that will be done by the end of this year so the agency can be up and running early new year and they will deal with supporting the refuge, the accommodation, the services on the ground, they'll deal with communications, doing the surveys that I mentioned with the CSO, but also implementing the whole of government plan and kind of coordinating that with the minister. Separate to that then we have the sexual offences legislation uh, which is now joined together with the human trafficking bill um, and that is about looking at really vulnerable people, particularly from a human trafficking point of view, those who are forced into prostitution, those who are brought here, um, you know, who are most vulnerable, how do we support them? And then separately looking at the issue of consent um, and making sure that it's clearly understood in the courts, but that the onus is put back on the perpetrator, not the victim. So they're just some of the areas, but there's other elements that were, you know, there's other issues we're exploring and looking to see whether it requires new laws or whether we can make changes in policy as well. You mentioned refuge spaces, and obviously under the Istanbul <coughs> Convention, it's recommended that Ireland should have 476. Now we did have 140 and you committed to doubling that to 280. Why are you not going the full way that the Istanbul Convention recommends? So we will absolutely but the, the commitment was to double what we have now in the lifetime of this strategy which is five years. So obviously beyond that there'll be a new strategy and there'll be another commitment to move further and I know people say right doubling 140 odd in five years why can't you do more? Um, it's not I suppose it's not the same as building a house so you need to make sure you have the services there that are going to run it you need to make sure you have an appropriate site or you're able to build something you need to have the right kind of accommodation you need to have the space and the services actually within that as well so making sure you have the staff and the team and then you need to make sure that you have other supports essentially for people in the area so as well as the refuges that we have safe houses within the vicinity so I suppose you, a lot of things have to come together, a lot of people have to come together and plans have to be put in place so it just takes a bit longer. But we have a lot of projects already being progressed in Navan, in Dundalk, in Wexford. We're linking in with uh, another nine areas where land's either been bought, where project teams have been put in place um, and there's progress being made and money being given to progress them. So I, I'm happy how we're progressing. Um, the groups that I'm working with on the ground, I think, are happy. But obviously, I mean, the target is where we need to get to. This strategy will only get us so far, but the next one I hope will, will continue that. Given the homelessness crisis and the fact that people who are living in these situations find it very hard to move out for financial yeah. reasons, for the lack of housing available, are you not worried that you're leaving people in potentially what could be very, very dangerous situations and their lives could be on the risk by the lack of refuge spaces that we have available? Well, we don't have enough, that's absolutely certain, um, but... I suppose it's one of my priorities to make sure that we get as many of them up and running as soon as possible. We also have to look at other ways to try and protect people and that's keeping victims in their home. So it shouldn't be the victim that has to leave always and children and the uprooting and the upheaval. You know, that's why so many people stay because they don't want to they don't want to cause any more upset, but obviously staying with an abuser, it's not the right thing to do. So we're exploring again, because this has been looked at before, but we're exploring again how we could make sure that the victim, that the family, that the children are the ones who stay in their home and that it's the perpetrator who has to leave. And that's a work in progress at the moment. But uh, I think for me, that's the most important thing. We shouldn't need more and more refuge and accommodation. We should actually be needing less. But Obviously, that's not the case. We do need them, and I accept that, and we're working towards it. I remember at the launch of the domestic violence strategy, you said something, and it was along the lines of, I can't put myself in the WhatsApp groups. I can't be there on the nights out. This really has to be a whole of society and a whole of culture change of mindset. Are you happy that that mindset is changing? Do you think we have a long way to go? Do you think that the message is getting home to people that this kind of situation isn't okay, that when you have women in fear of their lives sometimes? I think we're getting there. Um, I think there's a lot of work still to do. I think, I think COVID really was very positive in highlighting it as an issue. I don't think re people realised how, how prevalent it was 
right across society and I think um, even the most recent surveys that we've had really highlight it but I, I go back to my original point the fact that more women were murdered in their homes than there were homicides the fact that one in every five women have said they've been raped if that was any other crime or statistic I would wonder would people be marching on the streets and you know screaming and roaring the place down it's not happening. I do think people are listening. I do think they've sat up. I do think more people are on board with trying to bring about change. But I think we need to just keep talking about it. It's like a lot of issues. It comes into the domain and then it often leaves it. But my priority and my objective be around the agency, the zero tolerance plan is keeping it on the agenda at the highest level in government, but in our schools, in our communities, in our WhatsApp groups, in all of the rooms. Um, and the only way we do that is by campaigns like the one that you're running, you know, me continuing to prioritise it as minister, the organisations continuing to talk about it, and media, you know, showing that this is, is still a problem. Can I ask you about hate speech legislation really quickly? Obviously, there's been a huge backlash to that. Are you surprised by the amount of backlash there's been? I mean, we see Fianna Fáil at their parliamentary party last night. They've decided to have now a separate group to discuss this legislation and the fact that perhaps their parliamentary party didn't really know exactly the ins and outs of this legislation while it was being voted through in the door. Are you surprised by that? Do you think that if you went and you defined the word hatred like so many people are calling for, that that would really quell this argument and perhaps you might have a little bit more support on this? I think there's a lot of misinformation out there on this. Um, I think there's genuine concerns, but I think those genuine concerns are being fed by a lot of misinformation, a lot of it coming online. You only have to look at some of the commentary um, that is being put out there that we're trying to shut down people's thoughts, their speech, uh, that by not defining hate, we're leaving it open to anybody being charged for any reason or saying anything. And that's simply not true. So what I'm asking people, and I'm hoping to meet with you know, many of my colleagues and anybody who has concerns here, if you look at the legislation we're bringing forward, so much of it is a replica of what we already have. And I think that's a point that's been missed. So there's been issues raised with me, you know, whether around the powers that the Gardaí have, whether it's around particular language that's been used, it's an exact replica of what's already there. And as you know, we'll all be aware, there aren't mountains of people being prosecuted for hate speech. Um, hate crime is new, and I think that's, there's less of an issue for people around that. But from a hate speech perspective, I mean, the word hate, people know what hate is. Um, and the legal advice to me, and I understand this, is that if you start defining hate, then you then have to define those words. So if you're in a court of law and you have three different words that are used in a piece of legislation to define hate, you then have to prove that all three of those acts or those feelings were pointed towards this person. So we're trying to improve our 89 law, which is already in place. You would start to make it more difficult, then there's no point in improving it. Like the reason we're improving it is because it's ineffective. We've seen very few prosecutions. So if you actually make it more difficult for people to be prosecuted, we might as well not be doing this in the first instance. That's not to say we're putting in place protections for freedom of speech. We're putting in place protections for people who want to speak in a political vacuum, for people who are in universities, in colleges, in schools, for people who want to use their artistic license to say what they feel. This is really about people who go out, who intentionally or doing something knowing that it's going to cause harm, say things that are really harmful, really hurtful, and could actually result in people being physically hurt. And there are minority groups, be it because of their religion, their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, the disability they might have, that are at the moment really afraid in this country. And I met with some of them last week who were saying this legislation can't come quick enough. I'll give you one example. I don't know if you saw during the week that Dermot Kennedy had to apologise. He was doing an interview and he was asked for Irish slang and he said, oh, well, you know, if you say you're knackered, that means you're really tired. But if you cut the ED off the end of knackered, well, then that's a word that is really bad. Then he gave an example of the situation might be used in. That resulted in huge backlash online. He had to apologise and there was some tweets going, well, if Helen McEntee's hate crime legislation was in place, Dermot Kennedy would be in prison for five years. Is that the case? No. No, and this is what I keep trying to say to people. I mean, he wasn't trying to offend anyone. He wasn't trying to incite others to go out and hate a group of people. I mean, he was simply discussing something. And, and I think in that sense, we have kind of gone off the kilter a little bit. I mean, you'll be well aware of programmes that we've all watched growing up, Friends uh, and others. You know, and now there's language being taken out 
because it's potentially deemed offensive to people now. That's nothing to do with my bill. That's where we're moving at the moment. That's a, a kind of a, a word, a war of words, a culture war that's happening um, you know, on many different issues. So all of this is happening now. People are trying to cancel each other. People are screaming each other down on social media and other spaces, irrespective of my legislation. What I actually have in the legislation are defences and very clear um, very clear rules which allow people to talk about issues um, and be protected and, and, and not fear that they're going to be prosecuted simply because they say something. What if someone off the back of that though, what if that was reckless, you know, if someone went and they, I don't know, attacked a, a halting site? And if they track that back to what Dermot Kennedy said, then would Dermot Kennedy be prosecuted? And I'm just using his, him as an example because it has been topical this week. Is that mm. reckless and inciting hatred even if he didn't mean to? No, because he wouldn't have done it thinking, well, I'm going to do this in the likelihood of some random person going ahead and attacking somebody. It's not going to happen that way. But also you have to remember, a guard has to decide that this needs to go to the DPP. The DPP has to have enough evidence to show that, for example, the person you mentioned said this, knowing it would likely cause somebody to go off and attack another person. It then has to go to court where a jury of peers, so me, you and anybody else who look at this objectively would say, well, he really didn't think this. Like, these are all the steps we're talking about. And that example you've used clearly shows that the person would not be prosecuted but you know, this is the misinformation that's out there. And, and obviously I need to clarify it. I need to make these examples clear, but I hope even in clarifying the example you've given, which I have heard people talking about, it's very clear that this type of a thing is not going to be criminalized. This type of language is not going to be criminalized. But if he intentionally said something that he knew, you know, was going to encourage people to go out and potentially attack somebody or a group of people, that's really different. That's somebody setting out an intent because of a hatred of a group of people, simply because of who they are. And I don't, I don't think that's right. I don't think people should be allowed to do that.